Hey folks, Steve here with another World in Flames video. Uh, this video is going to be a roundup of the expansions for World in Flames. Uh, someone had requested that I do a video uh, on the expansions to talk about each one and, and maybe why uh, you would want to have it and use it in your World in Flames game. So uh, that's what this video is for. Now there's some organizational challenges in trying to talk to all of these expansions and this video may be a little long. Um, I think I will try to include some hyperlinks in the video description uh, as a shortcut to the part of the video um, where I'll be speaking about a specific expansion. So if you really only care about a particular one that you've heard about and you'd like to see me talk about it, uh, you know, check the description below, find the hyperlink, and it should take you to uh, the timestamp in the video uh, where you can uh, listen in on that particular expansion. Um, I will say that this video is going to be focused on the state of World in Flames as of the Collector's Edition printing. Um, so one of the challenges that has kind of come up in, in the way World in Flames has been printed over the years is that previous versions of products have been released in different formats. And what I mean by that is when World in Flames was the last previous edition, which was referred to as the final edition, uh, even though it wasn't, um, it had a series of expansions, uh, several, that covered different aspects of things, like uh, one called Convoys in Flames that added more convoy mechanics, and one called Cruisers in Flames that added a, you know changed how cruisers were, were handled, and things like that. Um, with the new Collector's Edition, those products have been combined and reformatted to give you the same counters that ultimately you would want to use for some of these things, uh, but in a easier to procure format, I guess I'll put it. So if you're watching this and you have a final edition copy of the game and you want to look for expansions for that, um, I believe the new Collector's Edition era expansions are compatible. But for the purposes of this video, because I know there's going to be newer folks uh, that are new to World in Flames wanting to get some information, I am just going to assume that you are going to be working with the Collector's Edition latest printing and sort of all of the standard uh, versions of these expansions that are coming out. And I'll try to talk a little bit about you know which products these replace, but I'm going to be leveraging a lot of ADG's own product descriptions to do so because I do not have uh, in a physical format uh, any of these products because I'm still waiting on my shipment um, which will be coming sometime over the next month. Um, so bear with me as I try to go through here um, and, and organize my thoughts. I've got a bunch of tabs open so I can kind of bounce around and I've got uh, a vassal module open that I'll, I'll switch to. Um, I'm going to be uh, using the last previous edition's vassal module for some uh, you know the showing of certain things but know that whatever I'm showing is previous edition material it's not going to be exactly whatever the new edition stuff will be um, it's purely just to give you an idea of what's going to be in these products um, that that are out there uh, a few of these expansions mainly the standalone game expansions uh, days of decision 3 America in flames and Patton in flames are going to be compatible with the collector's edition but they're not being reprinted necessarily you can still purchase them from ADG or pick up a used copy somewhere or whatever and and they're going to be fine and dandy um, so we'll get to that finally before we get really underway uh, I want to make a special shout out thank you to a uh, user on board game geek uh, Wendell uh, handle is also with Wendell world and Fl uh, flames Wendell um, uh, it, this guy is a great guy, always providing uh, support on forums, answering folks' questions, um, and just in general providing expertise. And a while ago, he had created a guide to the World in Flames universe, Board Game Geek. Uh, I don't know if it's a, a list. I guess you would call it a list. Um, I'm going to include a, a link to that in the description below because ultimately, you know, at least until this new collector's edition had come out, that was a really great way to read about what are all the expansions, what are all the different products in the World in Flames universe, and to, to catch up on that. So to give Wendell his due, um, you can read that as well if you'd rather read some of the information I'm going to talk about in different detail. Uh, I don't believe that list has been updated to reflect the collector's edition era of things, um, 
but it's worth a read. So so check that out. Um, in talking about the expansions, I've sort of organized all the things that you can try to go out and get uh, into categories. So I'm gonna I'm gonna pull up my notepad here where I sort of try to logically arrange these things. So I see expansions in World and Flames in a couple of different flavors. There's light expansions that either come uh, as, you know, how you're going to get them today anyway, are in uh, magazines, the, the annuals that had come out in the past that are somewhat still available, uh, that add not a whole lot to the game, but, but relatively minor things uh, you, you're going to add to the game. Um, then there are the main expansions, which mostly add a ton of new counters and some minor changes to the rules that you're going to use. And then finally, the standalone expansions that are technically uh, standalone games in and of themselves, but can be combined with World and Flames to get a ever-expanding uh, and nuanced game that you're going to play. Um, and obviously, all these things kind of tie into... You know, if you're going to play a game of World and Flames, what are you going to include? Are you going to include this expansion or this optional rule? Some optional rules are only going to be used with an expansion. Um, a lot of a lot of different work there. And I think in my last video of my introduction of World and Flames, I said uh, you do not need the expansion to have a good time, and I will stick by that. So if you're intimidated by anything I talk about here, uh, do not fear. The base game is a fantastic game. Check it out. Give it some play. If you decide you want to dig deeper, obviously the expansions are going to be out there. Some of the challenge of this is that some of these light expansions are not as readily available as they used to be. So I'll talk a little bit uh, for those as, as we go through uh, the process. So um, let's yeah let's let's get into it. Um, so the first of the light expansions that used to be part of a pre previous edition. Um, you know, main expansion is the Africa map. So the base game of World and Flames, and I'm going to pop open the, the Vassal module real quick, uh, is that it, it covers Europe and Asia. So you can see here it's, uh, and remember this is the last edition, so this map is not final for the new collector's edition. You've got Europe here that stretches into, uh, oh, I'm having some rendering. <laughs> going into the USSR, and then you can attach it to some other maps that cover the rest of Asia, China, and the Pacific Ocean. And if you wanted to, to play and, and do things in Africa, what you were doing was uh, you were either playing in North Africa, which is on map, or you were looking at these sort of side boxes that included pieces of Africa. You can see Egypt, you know, southern Egypt, crossing into Sudan, Ethiopia is one little little hex here for that purpose. Um, you can kind of see you've got a little bit of Africa over here, Kenya, uh, and uh, Madagascar is sort of hanging out over here on the Pacific map, some parts of South Africa, and then otherwise you've got bits and pieces still on uh, the, the border of the map. Now, you know, that's well and fine. You, you can play a game of World and Flames with that, and, you know, unless you're doing a lot of crazy stuff in Africa that may, may be a historical, you know, that's probably sufficient, if a little bit hokey, to just look at these little chunks and imagine they're part of Africa. So in one of the uh, expansions, and, and I can't remember the last edition which one it was, I might have to cheat a little bit and look at uh, one of Wendell's <laughs> posts, uh, I think it was Africa Aflame, uh, which added, you know, some, some units that are now being reorganized, and I'll get to that. Uh, but it included this Africa map, an extra Africa map. And so I'm going to, in the old Vassal module, you can bring it up like so. It'll render in a second here. It's probably going to be really slow. Um, or my computer will die trying to open all this up. Uh, and so you would get this additional fold-out map that covered uh, these places that were those little cutouts, you actually get on, I think the scale is supposed to be uh, the Asia map scale, or it might be the North America, South America map scale. Um, but you, you got a lot more room to work with. So if you wanted to, 
you know, have some crazy combat in Rhodesia, well, you you actually have the actual hexes here, and, um, you know, I, I see this as an exercise in fidelity. So, again, if you're playing the base game, you can get by without this map. And you're, you're probably going to be fine. It's not a big deal. Uh, however, if you want extra detail in Africa, then you'd want to get a hold of this map and use this map. It's obviously going to take up more table space if you're playing the physical copy. And the new Collector's Edition maps actually include some parts of Ethiopia on, I think it's the Pacific map. Um, and so whether or not this map, which is made for the final edition, 7th edition of the game, will be really well compatible with the new version, I can't, I can't tell you yet. I've, I've got to play around with the map comparison. Um, but it's still, you know, it might be something worth having if you'd like to play around with that a little bit more uh, for an Africa-type scenario. And in general, it might just be fun to have this map if you wanted to do some crazy custom variant scenarios or something related to wars in Africa. Um, and, you know, if you're playing one of the, you know, broad, broadly expanded versions of World in Flames, like adding in the post-World War II stuff, uh, you could still do that uh, with, this, with this map as well. The only problem with getting a hold of this map is that uh, you will would either need to try to buy a copy of Africa Aflame, or uh, somewhere on here on the ADG website, um, it used to be under WIF World, so you can get Africa Flame, and I think it'll come with the map. Uh, and he, I think you used to be able to buy the map separately as well, though I'm not seeing it here. Now I ordered. Uh, when I ordered my new collector's edition of the game, I put in for... Oh, here we go. Uh, okay. Oh, well, this is the deluxe, so it's going to give you a bunch of extra stuff. Hmm. When I ordered my super deluxe version of the collector's edition, uh, they sent me a map, the, the Africa map, separately. As just its own sort of thing that is included, because when I bought the super deluxe, it's anything and everything, um, this particular one here. I think this is the one you would want if you were doing that today. So that's one way to get it. Uh, otherwise, you can also look on the secondary market for it. Um, whether or not I'm going to end up using it if I ever play World in Flames, uh, I don't know. I don't know. It's really going to depend on uh, if I'm playing a Vassal game, then I will maybe use the map. Why not? I mean, it's there. It's not. A, it's not a lot of extra effort. If I'm playing in person, I probably won't, unless I have a truly huge amount of of table space to work with, and I can leave the game up for a long time, and I'm not equipped to do that. So, as a light expansion by itself today, it's going to be kind of hard to go find it and nab it somewhere. I also don't think it's incredibly uh, required or you know it's not a not something that's going to give you a huge amount of value back so for the Africa map it's a cool ad not critical um, moving on to uh, the Scandinavia map so this is another one that is a little bit uh, a little bit different now I'm not sure I'm trying to think where this first showed up and again, I might be cheating trying to look on Wendell's uh, list here, um, but I'm not 100% sure where... Uh, let's see. Okay, so this was an Asia Aflame. Uh, the original Scandinavia map was an Asia Aflame. And just to show you what it looks like, it is this little guy right here. So this is, this is what you get. Uh, the Scandinavian Connection map. It was in the Asia Flame expansion for the previous edition. It is not being released as part of any major product component in the Collector's Edition. So if you would like a copy of this map, very much like the Africa map, you'll either need to buy a previous expansion, which pretty much everything else in the expansion is, I think, made obsolete now. So you're, you're, you'd be buying that just for the map. Or again, uh, when I got my Super Deluxe order for the new edition, I did get sent this map separately. Now, all it's really going to give you is uh, a little bit, um, you know, just just like the Africa map, 
uh, you get a little bit of these cutouts on the border of the map. So you can see there's Norwegian Sea, and you get a couple of these hexes. Same thing over here, uh, where if you are looking at the Scandinavia map, you get that in more of a real, you know, laid out for real and in, in the connections to the other part of the map. Um, I'm going to put this in the same boat as the Africa map. This is a nice to have. It's not a very big map. And ultimately, you know, how much it's going to be a value is going to depend on if you, you know, want to go to the extra effort on fidelity. Um, I, this is one I'm not sure I would bother to use. Uh, if, you know, again, if I'm playing in Vassal, sure, why not? I mean, it's right here. It's one click away. Who cares? In a full game, in person, it's going to come down to table space. So if, you know, if you got your own deluxe edition of the Collector's Edition game of World and Flames, and you're worried about this one because it's a little bit harder to get, don't don't sweat it. This, this goes for the Africa map as well. Don't sweat it. Um, ADG might reprint these. Uh later and I don't know if there'll be any changes or if they'll be changed to to connect up better with the collector's edition maps. But there there may be the possibility that we'll get new versions of these guys anyway. Um so not a critical expansion. Not not much of one anyway. Um oops. so uh the next expansion in, in the light expansion series that I'm going to talk about just really briefly is one called Khaki and Flames. Um, I think you can still buy it on the store. It's somewhere in here under the Whiff World ADG page, along with, you know, you can go on the secondary market. And for the most part, what that was for was that uh, the original edition uh, of World and Flames, um, or all previous editions, the Commonwealth counters were this dark blue that was not very fun to read. And it just wasn't a good color choice, I don't think, for the Commonwealth, personally. Eventually, they made Khaki and Flames, um, who was most, I think, you know, designed by Andrew Raider, who did Fatal Alliances. And what the purpose of that expansion was, to enable you to have pretty much every counter for the Commonwealth redone with the counter being khaki-colored. Um... See if I can show you what I mean. Okay, so um, looks like this vassal module is already set up with all the khaki colored counters. So you can see, you know, the khaki, the the tan khaki color here. All these counters are for the Commonwealth, and they're all this nice, you know, easy to read uh, khaki color. But they weren't always that color, and um, you know, this vassal module sort of, you know, naturally builds it in. Uh, I'm not even sure there are any non-khaki counters in here. Um, so, I guess I'll put it this way. If you are getting the Collector's Edition, don't worry about khaki and flames. The Collector's Edition of World and Flames is coming out and already includes, uh, or rather, and not just includes, but just the, the Commonwealth counters are all going to be khaki. So, there's no reason that you need khaki and flames. Um, I'm trying to think back. I do have a copy of it because they just sent it to me. The only thing khaki and flames is part of, is worthwhile to have, especially if you have the Super Deluxe, is that there are a few counters that are not part of the base Collector's Edition game uh, because they're counters that are in some of the standalone games. So, American Flames, uh, Patton and Flames, uh, I think maybe Days of Decision as well. These had, I believe, dark blue counters to match the regular part of the game. Um, and so if you were going to be playing those with your collector's edition, there are a few counters uh, of which the base game doesn't have a khaki version for because it's not in the game, right? Khaki and Flames would replace those counters for you. They're not necessarily needed. So I'll put it this way. <laughs> If you're getting the Collector's Edition, and you want to get America in Flames and Patton in Flames, which I will talk about later in this video, as standalone expansion games that can be added to World in Flames, and you don't want to use the blue counters in those games with all of your khaki Collector's Edition counters, then you can get khaki in Flames. It would, it would be worth it for that. 
but the cost might be not worth it to you, right? I mean, it, it, when it first came out, Khaki and Flames was useful because you could replace every counter in the games that you owned with these counters, and it, it replaced everything, which was great. And I think it also included a couple of minor optional rules in the little pamphlet that came with it. Um, today, because of the collector's edition, if you bought Khaki and Flames, it would only be useful for the America and Flames counters and the Patton and Flame counters. And so the value is not as great as it once was. I believe you can still get Khaki and Flames today. I believe they're readily available. Um, this is going to be a maybe buy. It's going to be a maybe buy and mostly because uh, if you're going to look at it from a completionist annoyance factor, I don't even want to bother using a dark blue counter at this point. So I am going to punch uh, the khaki counters that I'm going to need from my khaki and flames copy uh, so I can play everything with khaki, right? Because I'm going to use America and flames, because I'm going to use Patton and flames. I might want to do that. That's what I'm going to do. Um, so, you know, it may be more worthwhile than the Africa and Scandinavia maps, but, um, you know, eh, mixed bag. Okay, the next one that I will talk about is the Leaders in Flames expansion. Now, this originally came out with the 1998 World in Flames annual magazine. I'm going to use the Board Game Geek to kind of talk through some of this. And, and really what it's going to add are leaders to the game. Now, this is the counter sheet that comes with the magazine. The magazine itself would also include uh, the rules. This magazine is going to be hard to find right now. Um, I managed to get a copy from ADG, but I think it was like their last, I don't know, handful of copies of the magazine. I don't even see a product page on their website for it anymore. So if you're going to get Leaders in Flames, or you want to try to find Leaders in Flames, you might need to look at the secondary market. This is the counter sheet that you're going to get. And ultimately, the only thing that's really new in here that's out of this ca this counter sheet are these little, you know, leader pictured counters. Obviously representing, you know, famous leaders of World War II. Uh, so I have it. I'm not sure I'm ever going to use these things. My, my basic uh, understanding is that the reception of this, uh, of Leaders in Flames, has kind of been lukewarm. Um, I... And I, I guess I don't know too much more than that. I, I do have it. I have read the rules a little bit. Um, it doesn't really seem like it's needed. I mean, you already have HQ units in the game. That's kind of close to leaders, and, and they tend to have names. And that It's just adding on a layer that I'm not sure is worthwhile. Um, so if you can find it, and the idea of pushing around these name leaders with these pictures and all that sounds cool to you, then it might be worth a shot. Again, your your real challenge is going to be uh, finding a copy of this. Again, 1998 manual. That's mm, that's pretty old now. That's almost 20 years old. Uh, it's going to be tough to to find it. Um, if I look here on Board Game Geek, uh, someone in Italy is selling a copy. So rush out and get it now if you want it. Um, but uh, yeah, not not much more I can really say about Leaders in Flames. Um, I, I don't think it's needed. You can probably skip it if you're getting the Collector's Edition and you want to get expansions. This one, if you don't ever get, you'll probably be okay. Um, next one I want to talk about is... Uh, hold on, let me find it. The Factories in Flames light expansion that came in the 2008 annual. So it's technically the most recent one, and the one that's probably going to be most readily available to you, whether it's trying to buy it online um, or secondary market. Technically, this magazine, and I'm speaking to this in, in magazine rather than just the Factories and Flames expansion itself, is because it, it comes with Commandos and Flames as well. Um, I think this is going to be a worthwhile pickup for a couple of reasons. So... You know, this is going to be compatible with uh, the Collector's Edition. The Commandos in Flames kit that comes with it is basically just going to be providing some additional 
divisions and core, or I think it's just divisions maybe, specialized units. They're kind of neat from a historical flavor perspective. Um, they're not, you know, again, a lot of this comes down to fidelity. So if you like having a certain kind of troop, um, you know, famous specialists and stuff like that, it might be worth picking up for fun. But the factories and flames part of this magazine expansion uh, are was, a, I'll say, a pretty big deal because of what they do. And I'm going to switch to this for a second. Um, let's see if I can find it somewhere in here. <laughs> somewhere in this old vassal module, they have the factories and flames uh, support for it. I'm just not sure where they put it. Uh, it's probably staring me right in the face, and I can't find it. Special charts? This is some of it. Hmm. <laughs> oh, this does have the leader, leaders and flames bit. Um, boy, I'm gonna be frustrated if I can't find it. So, so here's the thing. Here's here's what factories and flames does. The the factories and flames system that lays on top of everything else basically sets it up that your production is not sort of uh, nebulous. And what I mean by that is in the base game of World and Flames, you know, your resources get to your factories and you get build points and when you build them, they go onto the production circle. Um, they go around the production circle as they get, you know, built. Or rather, the turn marker moves around the circle and then eventually the units that you wanted to buy, you get to the month that they are completed and you place your units uh, where you're allowed to place your units, which is usually your home country. Okay, that sounds fine, right? I mean, that, that that's that's fine. What Factories and Flames does is it says, you're going to build a unit. Let's just say I'm Germany and I'm going to build a new Panzer Corps. Factories and Flames asks you, where do you want to build it? And so, let's say I want to build it in Berlin. So it's got three factories and... Um, there's a few things that are tied up in that, but ultimately, what it really means, um, and and dang it, I'm going to find wherever they're at in here. I know they exist. Um, there's a there's a track that comes in the magazine. Uh, they're they're charts, um, and what it is, is that each one of these factories and each of the major country home countries, each of these factory spaces has a little track for it, and when you go to build a unit. You're going to choose one of your cities to start building the unit in. And then depending on how many production points uh, is needed and, and how long it takes to build, it's going to go somewhere on that track. And it's going to move down the track every turn until it completes. And what's important about that is that if I wanted to protect the production of that unit, I'm going to want to build it in a place I think that the allies can't bomb me. So I might say, okay, uh you know, Breslau, that's pretty far away from UK bombers. I'm going to build this unit in Breslau uh, rather than, say, Hamburg. Because Hamburg is going to get bombed. It's going to get bombed a lot, probably. Um, and units that are on the build track for that factory space may be damaged and it may be tougher to complete the build. Additionally, if, say, you lose uh, uh, the, the hex, you, I think, uh, you might lose out on that unit being built. So it, it, it takes the sort of nebulous aspect of the production part of World in Flames, which by itself is fine. It is ultimately a, a fine production system. It, you know, it, it works the way most of these games work, the, of these type. But Factories in Flames puts an added focus on being more realistic with production and the economy of your nation and where you're building stuff and, and how you're building things. Um, it also includes some rules about specialized factories. So it might be that uh, Stetten becomes a specialized naval factory shipyard and so it gets bonuses for building uh, naval units or you know Dresden becomes specialized for aircraft units and things like that. You can get into that level of detail and then as you take over like the red factories um, and say like France 
uh, you know, then you just get to start potentially building units on those tracks on that handout player aid sheet showing all these tracks. Now it adds a lot more table space because you're going to have a lot of different charts that are sitting on the table showing all these different locations because you're going to have a chart for the USSR, you're going to have a chart for Japan, you're going to have a chart for the United States. Um, all these major powers, the Commonwealth, are going to have these chart pages with tracks for each factory space. And I swear it's in this vassal module. I'm not I'm not uh I'm not making it up. They're they're in here somewhere. Um oh God, they're somewhere. I feel so bad, you guys, for, for not having it um to show. Oh, is okay. Well alright. Here here's a good example though of what they look like. You can see you get a, a track and it counts down until you get deploy. Um maybe they're uh, so close. Uh, it looks like the rules got included in this as well, so, you know, <clears throat> however you decide uh, the ethical questions about using Vassal, if you don't own the game, here it is. Factories and Flames. Oh my gosh, can't believe I was, it was staring me right, staring me right in the face. Um, I apologize for that. I'm going to end up spending way too much time on this expansion now. <laughs> Factories and Flames. Here's the German one. So, Berlin. Bop, 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 bop deploy. Uh, Breslau, it's got a naval yard, so you can, uh, they've got some extra information for the construction pool. And so, you know, a again, it adds realism and strategic decision-making to your build in addition to what you're building. And I just think that's awesome. I mean, I just, I, I think that's really cool that you can go to that level. Um, I've heard it doesn't add that much playtime and complexity to the game, and because it's sort of a, a logical thing, the rules for it make a lot of sense, right? Um, and then one thing that kind of goes with it is that uh, it, if you choose to do Factories and Flames, you can also use the 3D10 combat chart. So there's a 1, 1D10, that's the base game. There's an optional rule for 2D10, that is really good. This one allows you to do a 3D10, and what it, what the rules here tie up to, tie, tie in with Factories and Flames, just to to be really quick about it, is you can do damage to units that that don't totally destroy the unit, and it may mean that that unit's going to go to a factory to be repaired, rather than just um, being you know a core gets wiped out. Uh, it it may end up be uh, um, let's see if I can grab some of this on here. <sighs> Well, I, I won't spend any more time on this because I just know I'm just spending so much time just trying to describe this expansion. Um, again, it, 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 what, it, what it can do is it granularizes, if that's a word, uh, how units get hurt. Rather than just they get wiped out and you got to rebuild them, they, they may potentially go back to uh, uh, be worked on at a factory, that kind of thing. So... Um, in general, the the annual for the 2008 annual, I would say if you like making the 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 production part of World in Flames more realistic, make a little more sense, I guess, from just a common sense perspective, and units just aren't popping into existence <laughs> out of nowhere, get the 2008 manual. Go out and find it. Get it. I think it's a really cool thing. I might not always want to play with it, but I think it's a cool enough feature. Um, the fidelity is a lot of value for what you're doing with the game, um, and it, it, it's worth worth taking a look at it. Uh, and then finally, the last light expansion I'm going to talk about in this video uh, comes from the Millennium Annual. Uh, I think, so I assume 2000 is the year. Yeah, 2001 is when it came out. Um, so it's technically older than the 2008 Manual. Uh, and what what uh, what the actual expansion that's in this is politics and flames. Now, uh, the the politics and flames aspect of this is, uh, and I'm sure I'm going to have a heck of a time finding it on here, just like I have had a heck of a time finding everything else. Um, what politics and flames is meant to do? 
is provide an alternative uh, to the base game sort of suppositions for diplomatic relations and how these countries interact. Um, I want to find the content in here. I apologize, I don't have this just opened up to use. Um, dang. Maybe it's not included in the, the Vassal module. Yeah, it might not be. Uh, well, so I'll, I'll, I'll put it this way. Uh, the Politics and Flames expansion is a relatively lightweight way to add a political dimension to World and Flames. So again, the base game makes certain uh, diplomatic, you know, linear result kind of thing, right? Certain countries are going to ally with the Axis powers. Certain countries definitely are not going to. Um, and the, you know, there's some situations where a country might join if you do some special actions, if you take certain places. Uh, but that's just, you know, that's built into the base game and it's very rigid. If you want some flexibility, politics and flames can modify it so that you're investing sort of diplomacy points, we'll say, into different countries and you can end up with a little bit more ahistorical results or make it more of a fight to make the historical events sort of occur uh, with forces joining uh, uh, joining you. Um, I'm still looking around in here. I had thought I had seen seen it in this before, but um, I haven't really been using this Vassal module very much, so I'm not as familiar with it as I am uh, with the Fatal Alliances one. Um, Ah, oh, here we go. I found it. Um, all right, so just to show you, the the track starts from a neutral perspective, and you either drift towards uh, the Allies, which the Soviet Union's included in there, um, and the Axis. You can see that there are political costs. So uh, if I'm Germany, and I'm trying to influence Afghanistan, my cost is only two. But if I'm the Commonwealth, it's going to cost four. Germany influencing Denmark is a one. And let's see, Japan influencing Czechoslovakia is a five. Obviously much more expensive. So, so there's a certain amount of expected uh, results in here, which is to say, you know, countries that, that had good relations prior to World War II are going to have an easier time being influenced, but you can still play with uh, modifying how, how that ends up playing out. This chart actually looks very similar to the political chart from Fatal Alliances, and I'm quite sure that the Fatal Alliances political system is derived a bit from this expansion for World and Flames. So if you've played Fatal Alliances, some of that is going to come right in here uh, and look very, very similar uh, in terms of making uh, a country become an ally. And it's not just, oh, you know, I put enough points in, now they're my ally and they join. There's a gradient here. So a uh, country starts neutral, then it starts providing some resources, then it starts providing production, then it can uh, mobilize and become an active, an active ally. Um, so for, uh, you know, the sake of adding a little more sandboxy nature to your World in Flames game, this would be a good choice for that. Um, it's relatively lightweight. It doesn't add a whole lot of extra stuff to the game. Um, you know, you some of these expansions add fidelity, some of them add more sandbox uh, feel to it, and, and this is more of a sandbox one. You know, you could have uh, Germany do a lot of crazy diplomacy with countries maybe you wouldn't otherwise have thought to do, um, or, or impact, you know, maybe getting Spain, uh, fascist Spain on their side differently than uh, you would, I think, in the base game by maybe, I think it's taking Gibraltar or something like that, uh, there's a different way to go about doing that. So uh, if you can find the 2000 annual, the Millennium Annual, um, I'd say it's probably worth a pickup. I, I think it's worth checking this out um, and seeing what uh, what you can do with uh, the this subsystem. Um, now the magazine does come with a few other uh, counters in here. I think some of these may end up being included in 
uh, some of the collector's edition stuff. I'm not 100% sure, but just as a matter of course, I'd say this is worth picking up uh, if you can find a copy. So that's it for the light expansions. Um, 40 minutes in, oh boy. Uh, so those are the light expansions. And, and I, I use this the term light because these things are, are, are either coming piecemeal, if you can find it, or they come in small expansions or uh, magazines. And they add, you know, some, some things to the game, factories and flames being the biggest, you know, impact to the game that you're playing. Now I'm going to talk a little bit more about the main expansions. And these main expansions uh, have been developed with the collector's edition in mind. So there's going to be ships in flames, planes in flames, territories in flames, and division in flames. And uh, each of these is ultimately a combination and a redo of expansions that existed for previous editions of the game. Um, now these are all going to be available uh, with the collector's edition stuff, uh, the super deluxe or deluxe packages. If you bought those, you're going to get these. And they each expand uh, certain aspects of your counter uh, pools. Um, and so from a high level, like Ships and Flames is now an aggregate of all these other different uh, ship expansions that had come out over the years for previous editions in different time frames uh, over the years of playing World in Flames. So the, the current Ships and Flames is going to include stuff that in the old world was cruisers and flames and carriers and flames and convoys and flames. They've all been condensed down into a one package deal for if you want to really blow up your your ship game. Um, same thing with the rest of these. So uh, ADG is saying for ships and flames, you're going to add a thousand counters. A thousand counters to your World and Flames game. And what it's doing is, uh, you know, one, you're going to get this task force display, which is nice and helps you stay organized with your ship counters. But it fundamentally changes what you're dealing with in terms of, uh, of counters. You see here they say it incorporates cruisers and flames, convoys and flames, and carrier and flames all in one big, beautiful package. And... To kind of make sense of what that means, uh, if I look at, we'll, we'll just use the German force pool. If you wanted to build a ship in the base game, and just there's a lot of crap on the screen, so stay focused with my cursor. Uh, <laughs> uh, classic Navy, and just even even looking at some of these 1936. I'm gonna zoom in a little bit. Make this easier to see. Maybe zoom out again. Um, here's a, a, sh a ship counter. It is the Schlesen and the... Oh, God, I'm not even going to try. Uh, oh, and the Scharnhorst, the Turpitz, um, flip, and also the Bismarck. Um, so usually in the base game, you know, like a, a surface vessel counter is going to be two capital ships that are named on the counter, and then it it supposes that there are support ships sort of included in the counter strength. Like, it's not just these two ships, it's these two ships, and some other lighter cruisers uh, accompanying these two ships. Now, by comparison, uh, and this vassal module in the old world had a ships and flames type of thing, uh, Let's see if I can get a good example here. Flip. Flip. Okay. So here's the apparently damaged turpits. I'm not sure why it looks like that. Um, so in the base game counter, you have the, the turpits is uh, part of the Bismarck counter. Whereas in Ships and Flames, okay, that's the Graf Zeppelin. I'm just going to move that down here to get out of the way. The Turpitz is its own counter, its own individual counter. And if I can find it, and it's in here somewhere, flip. Oh, here's the Bismarck. So you have what is in the base game. Two ships are in one counter, and the strength is sort of rated and, and 
relative to all the other ships that are everything else combined. In Ships and Flames, imagine you're taking a magnifying glass and you're zooming in just a little bit. Now, those two ships are their own counters. And this also comes into things like uh, light cruisers, which um, I think are, are some of those ships that are subsumed into a base game naval counter. Now, they're individual counters. Same thing, the leap zig. So to, to succinctly sort of summarize what you're going to get with ships and flames is zoom in a level in terms of counters. So whereas, again, uh, before, and, and the rule book will tell you, right? It says a, a naval unit represents bop, 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 these number of surface ships and these number of support ships. All these other ships and flame counters are going to be, you know, one ship per counter in a lot of cases. And that means that if you want to split up the, the, the Tirpitz and the, the Bismarck, um, you can do that. You know, in, in the base game, they're together, and okay, that's how many forces you have. Well, now you could send Bismarck to the Atlantic, you can send the Tirpitz to the Mediterranean, you can do whatever you want because you have greater control and more granular control around all of your naval units. Now, I think Ships and Flames also enables you to play with a few more optional rules. Um, it changes a, a few things related to, I think, just movement and where things can go and interception rules and the size of fleets. Uh, so there's, you know, more, again, fidelity. I keep using that word. There's more fidelity for you to enjoy from the naval aspect of the game. And, you know, you can play this independent of the other expansions. And so, for instance, I might decide uh, that, you know, one, I don't want to play the full global game. Um, and bear with me as Vassal craps itself. Um, <laughs> as I'm trying to scroll around here and render the, the big map file. Let's say I don't want to play the global game, but I really like the Pacific War. I'm going to play a Pacific War game. I'm just going to, you know, there's there's scenarios for that in World in Flames. And I don't want it to be just the base game. I want it to be, uh, I want to have a little more fidelity. Well, then I can toss in the Ships and Planes expansion, and I have greater focus on the naval aspects. And obviously, um, the naval aspect, uh, sorry, I'm, I'm coughing because my throat's getting dry from talking. Um... I might want to have greater amount of detail and depth on the naval aspect of the game because that's a big part of the Pacific War, uh, and I, and I want to control it at that deeper level. And so, um, if you're a ship guy, you know, I'll just go ahead and kind of come to a conclusion on this expansion. If you're a ship guy, you really like naval stuff, you like, you like you know, the different kinds of ships, battleships, and the carriers, and, and all of that fun stuff, uh, I think Ships and Flames is worth it. I think Ships and Flames could be worth it even if you're not crazy about ships and <clears throat> you just want more detail and more control on how you spread out your naval forces. Um, and, of course, you know, they, they with the new counter art and the pictures of the ships, it all looks great. Um, I think it's a worthwhile uh, uh, check out for it. Um, yeah, I, I, I think it's pretty cool. I think it's a worth a look. I don't know that I'll always play with it, but that example I gave of a more detailed naval uh, rendition of the Pacific War would be pretty cool, pretty fun. I think that's that would maybe be my first time I'm going to end up using this expansion, is doing something like that, maybe with a friend of mine who really likes the Pacific War uh, as a topic of, of history um, would be worth it. Now, uh, I'm going to move on to Planes in Flames now, and uh, Planes in Flames is very similar in nature to Ships in Flames. So the way, the way they're describing it is, uh, you know, they're, uh, it's going to include every major and not-so-major aircraft in World War II in more de uh, detail. Um... Uh, expanded the scope of the time, and now span history from the early 30s to the mid-50s, 
And so uh, ADG is marketing this as being able to be played with Patent and Flames or American Flames as well as the base game. Uh, the counter count is a little bit smaller than than the Ships and Flames 600. Um, and what this is really going to do is it's going to add more more planes to your force pool. So again, if I look at the German force pool, um, all right, planes and flames. So in the base game, uh, you have uh, these planes that have the the cost and the turn number of terms it takes to build. What planes and flames adds uh, are going to be more more plane types, but it's also going to normalize some of the uh the oh boy i just i'm going to remove a whole bunch of counters uh they're going to normalize the time it takes to build them come on now fighting with my vassal here uh and it's also going to i believe this expansion also adds in the requirement to build and train pilots so in addition to not just building the plane, you're also building uh, or training pilots. You track the number of pilots that you have, and it is possible to take a pilot out of an air unit and put them in a new air unit. Maybe that new plane counter is better than the old plane counter that was in play. Um, and it saves you some of the production. So, so just as uh, an example here, I'm going to take a regular base game plane. So this uh, Junker uh, plane that is apparently very weak. Um, it's got this sort of build cost and turns to produce. And by comparison, you can see this build cost is cheaper. Now there are a different type of plane. Um, and so maybe I won't uh, maybe compare apples to apples here. We look at these two planes. Or even better, <laughs> one of a similar type. How about that? So these two planes, not quite the same plane, but close. And you're going to see it's going to cost five, three turns. And this one just tells you that it's going to cost three. Well, what it does, if you play with this expansion, is all the, plane, all the planes from the base game, I believe, have their production cost reduced by two. And you're just going to pay three. You're going to build the plane, and that's without the pilot. The pilot it costs two build points. You can kind of see five to three. What's missing two? Two's the pilot. The base game sort of assumes you're creating, you're training pilots when you build the counter. With Planes and Flames, I believe, I think it's still this way uh, in the Collector's Edition expansion, you're building the plane, and you can save on production costs because you might swap out the pilot. Now, pilots can die. Uh, and air combat, and then you have to train a new pilot. So again, like all these other main expansions, they're adding a certain amount of fidelity to uh, the air portion of the game. Um, but rather than, I believe, the ships and flames counters replace the ships in the base game, I believe that the planes and flame counters are added to your plane force pools, and then you just have to remember that anything that looks like this on the back is a base game one, and it's treated ever so slightly differently in terms of the cost. Um, I don't know how much I'm going to use Plane and Flames to start with once I have uh, the game. I think it's cool. Having the different variants added to the game definitely adds more variety. Um, and if you're a big plane geek, uh, obviously you're going to get a whole lot of enjoyment out of that and all the wonderful, wonderful uh, counter art that's available on there. Um, you know, the price point is pretty reasonable, I guess. Uh, so, you know, it's probably going to be worth a shot. You know, there's going to be a lot of interesting different planes in here uh, to compare and take a look at. So I would say this one's probably worth a look. Pretty cool. Uh, next main expansion we'll talk about here is the Territories and Flames uh, expansion. Now, what the intention of this is to sort of aggregate some counters that were strewn about across Asia aflame, Africa aflame, 
um, a few other places. And so it focuses on sort of these weird units. Um, so it's defining them as the territorial units, but they're not all just territorial units with the T on them. There are certain rules around what a territorial unit does. Um, territorials actually are in Fatal Alliances as well, the World War One game as default, um, though there's not too many of them. And usually they're just meant to be sort of these colonial units that, that are from a particular territory of an empire or country, and I think they're meant to sort of stay there and be garrisons, um, but this uh, expansion also includes other types of units. Um, like this uh, this example here, Singapore unit for uh, China. So it's supposing that Japan conquers Singapore and then China liberates it. Also includes the Warlord unit, so I think some of those may have been in one of the past uh, annuals that we talked about, one of the magazines. So they might be including those so that you don't need that. I'm not 100% sure. Uh, if, you, if you're watching this video and you're uneasy about me, me not me not being sure about something, I think they have some of the uh, counter manifests on the ADG website here in the download, so you may want to check that out. Um, they got uh, Siberians, Ukrainian National Army, uh, some extra things for building forts, adding new roads and rails, um, the, the counters uh, to support saving oil and build points, um, and that means, you know, having them actually saved on the map somewhere, uh, I believe. 400 counters. So, uh, you know, it doesn't add a, you know, it, it's not a huge, huge expansion. Like, you're not adding a metric ton of new rules. I do think they're really cool because the add in, you know, units and forces that font that you might not typically think about. Um, obviously, I love this, <laughs> this picture for the, the cover of it. Um, so th I think this is one that I, I will definitely use uh, myself. Um, I just think it's really neat. I'm also used to using territorials from playing Fatal Alliances. So for me, this is just more fun to, to add in uh, these extra units. Just really neat, neat things that can come up. The Warlords are kind of neat and how they work. Um, yeah, I, 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 think, I think this is a good one. I think this is worth uh, playing, playing with. Um, and again, it doesn't add uh, that much more rules uh, over the base game that it's a bother. Um, I, I think it's a neat addition, so uh, uh, worth taking a look. Um, then finally, the, the last main expansion is uh, Divisions and Flames. And to make sense of this... Uh, it's important to understand uh, the way the counters are used in the base game. So in the base game, the land units are in the base game are all organized by core. And a core is, uh, in NATO symbols, the three X's above uh, the symbol on a counter. Uh, and so, you know, everything's organized by core or army uh, with HQ units in the base game. What divisions are, the next sort of rung down in army structure organization, um, and they use the two X's. Now, uh, again, a bit like Territorials and Flames, Divisions and Flames is sort of an aggregate of some of the other previous edition expansions. So you come to one shop, you know, one-stop shop for all your division desires. Um, now, why divisions are interesting is that they add some more variation to what you can build. Um, division units are typically cheaper than cores, uh, unless they're highly specialized using special, high, highly expensive equipment that they might be as expensive. Um, so you can see some of the interesting examples here. Uh, you know, uh, the Rangers unit. It's got a little anchor icon, so these might be amphibious. I'd have to look up the rules. Um, you can see the Chindits uh, adding uh, artillery units as separate units. I think in the base game, you know, it's sort of assumed that these corps and army units have artillery. Well, with divisions, you can actually call out these artillery units. Uh, <laughs> Little Joe, uh, fun. Now, some of these are, are pretty, uh, 
you know, specialized, the ones that they're showing, um, also including some ba uh, guard banner armies, um, which is really rather interesting. 400 counters. Divisions are awesome. I, I think they're just really cool because you can have uh, these really neat additions that you might not ordinarily have. Um, and so just to show you kind of a, a comparison, um, and it's going to be kind of hard. I need to I need to figure out if there's any quick divisions I can grab from in here. Um, they're not as easily organized. Here, Here's maybe one. Yeah. So... This is a garrison division, not a garrison core, but a garrison division. Uh, and so it's cheap, one build point, two turns, relatively quick to turn around, and it's just a 1-1. One, one. And so that, you know, this being a garrison unit, not particularly valuable by itself. However, uh, here is a anti-tank, I think. Um, I'm going to probably read my... NATO symbols wrong. This might be anti-tank artillery. So it's a division, two X's. Uh, it's fairly, it, you know, it's as, as expensive as a core might be. But uh, it has special rules around defending against enemy tanks, and there might be some other rules wrapped up in that. Um, some of these units are in fatal alliances as well. Uh, so those are the specialized units, right? And, and again, they have special rules around some of them. And, you know, one, that adds, again, fidelity, also flexibility, uh, because you can sort of invest your production points in doing some non-standard things. Um, and it's also nice because if you're using divisions, the stacking limits in the game are different. Uh, I think in the normal game, it's like two core. But if you are using divisions, you can also add a division with the two core and it changes the sort of strength odd comparisons right like maybe ordinarily you have two four strength core well if you can add a two strength uh, division that takes your strength in that hex from eight to ten and if your opponent's not using divisions in that particular area that that gives you a wiggle room for better combat odds and then another thing that you can do, which, um, you know, I don't know how often folks really do this, but I think it's an interesting question of uh, uh, utility. You can actually take, uh, I should have left this open, um, I'm just going to grab one regular core. And that's okay, i got a couple of extra core, that's fine. Um, say I've got these core here. Now for some reason... I was going to try to do some fancy German amphibious assaults, but I don't have a lot of navy in place to help me do that. Uh, and I want to transport, you know, use a transport, and I'm going to take a division, or or even I want to cover uh, a line of communication or a line of supply or something. What I can do is I can take an existing core and I can split it in half into two divisions. And then have that, you know, one of the two divisions move over here, for instance, uh, if I needed to. Maybe I'm getting pushed back by the Russians and I need to, you know, keep my line consistent. I might split a full strength core in half into two divisions. They're interchangeable that way. Um, now, there's some rules surrounding how often you can do that. Uh, but it's it does add some flexibility uh, with how you want to compose your forces, right? Again, it's like some of these other expansions, you're zooming in a click, uh, like a, a magnifying glass or, or, or a telescope or whatever, you're going to zoom in a click and you're going to have um, a little bit more control over how you use your forces. Uh, so, you know, again, flexibility of normal units, a lot of specialized units and neat things like that. Um, I think I'm going to use Divisions and Flames every time I play. Uh, maybe not my very first game, especially if I'm playing with somebody else who's new. But I think almost every other time I'm going to want to use them. Just because they add so much more fun little tidbits of things and flavor. Um, I mean, just, <laughs> you know, looking at this, you know, little skull and crossbones. Oh, how cute. Um, all these different little units. Uh, NKVD, Broadenburgers. I mean, you just get uh, you just get to add a lot more neat little things to the game. And ultimately, it's not really any more rules. 
very little. Um, again, some of this is influenced by the fact that I have played Fatal Alliances, the World War One game, and Fatal Alliances uh, does include um, divisions by default. So I'm already used to playing with them. But in my mind, you know that that, that even if even if you aren't used to playing with them, uh, they're not a bad thing to add. So Division in Flames, I get the th I want to give the thumbs up to. Give give it a roll, nab it, um, check it out. It's it's going to be fun. A lot of neat little things you can do there. So that's it for the main expansions, right? And and again, if I'm you know I'm looking at my handy dandy notepad, uh, the light expansions, things that add, you know, light to medium weight new mechanics, maybe factories and flames being a, a pretty big change to mechanics. Um, the main expansions mostly being force pool changes uh, in terms of what units you have access to and what detail level you're working with the, the counters. Now I'm going to move on to the standalone expansions. And uh, the thing to keep in mind with these standalone expansions are that they are products that aren't getting new prints as part of the collector's edition, but should remain more or less compatible with the new edition. I say more or less because I think there's going to be a couple of uh, wrinkles between maybe Days of Decision and a couple others. Uh, but they are Days of Decision 3, American Flames, and Patent and Flames. Now these are intended so that you can play them as their own complete standalone board game. So I could reach into my closet, uh, bring out Days of Decision, or America in Flames, or Patent and Flames, and play them by themselves. They come with counters, they come with maps, they come with uh, dice, I'm pretty sure. Uh, some player aid charts, things like that. And if that's all you had, you could go and buy this and set it down, open it up. You could play a game. You could play a game, self-contained, uh, and have a good time. Now, uh, that's all well and good. Um, but you can also then include them, uh, at least the counters in some cases, to your World in Flames games. So uh, you could take uh, some, some or all, uh, depending on what game you're playing, and, and merge it in your World in Flames game, add the counters to your force pools, and you might not get to them, you might not use them, but they're sort of you know allowed, they're included. Um, and so it, it, it's a little bit harder to, to talk to these just because, again, you, you could just play them by themselves and they're their own fun little game. So uh, first one I'm going to talk about is the one that's most intriguing to me um, is Days of Decision 3. Now, why the 3? Uh, Days of Decisions 1 and 2 were more straight-up expansions, uh, I think, to World and Flames and not necessarily a standalone. Um, but this is the third sort of version of it. Uh, this one is kind of an interesting little beast. So if you're playing this game by itself, it comes with its own map. And here it is. It looks a little funky. Very high level. Right, you're zoomed out a little bit even. Um, kind of reminds me of uh, maybe an Axis and Allies almost, just because of how broad some of these regions are. Um, you would not use this map if you're combining this game with World and Flames. But what it's meant to show are the production uh, ratings of countries. And, you know, it's got some things like factories and resources. And what you're doing in here is playing the time frame leading up to World War II. And depending on how you're choosing to play it, including World War II. So, um... This game is like politics in flames on steroids uh, because there's ultimately a very large political display. And you have these sort of three poles that things gravitate around, uh, the democratic ideology, the fascist ideology, and the communist ideology. Now this game plays you know, quite a bit differently if you're playing the game by itself. If you're playing this game, it is really meant to be a three-player game, so that you have these ideologies being played by uh, a player each. 
And the point of the game is to basically try to dominate the world for your ideology. So you're not really just trying to win World War II, you're fundamentally trying to be in control of the world as much for your ideology as you can. Um, so the, the game operates on uh, these cards, not that card. No, not that either. I think this is it. There we go. So, and boy, these things are cute. <laughs> Let me zoom in so you can see. Uh, so, when you play the game, each player on a given turn is going to be able to play these cards, which in the physical copy are on player aid sheets, and you can either cut, cut them or copy them or whatever. Um... You play these cards, and they're going to have different effects. They're going to have diplomatic effects, which are listed here. Um, they're also going to show you how that impacts America's desire to join World War II when and if it happens. It's got a prerequisite, so certain things need to have happened before you can play it, and then it has an effect. Um, so you can see this one, Vienna Accord, Ribbentrop, and kind of hard to read. Support Romanian land claims against Hungary and Bulgaria. Uh, the Ukraine is sovereign state, um, so this is how you get, you know, you release Ukraine as a minor nation. Uh, so you get these different options, and some of these options, if it's a pre-war state, are going to influence your diplomatic situation. Um, others are going to maybe be played during the war and will impact the political landscape and diplomatic landscape of the game. So as where uh, politics and flames sort of just involved investing diplomacy points and adjusting how a country is treating you, you're sort of doing that in combination with, uh, again, these political action cards that, that you're playing. Um, now the, the sort of base, um, and I need to find it again, here we go, the map. If you're playing this by itself, the game has a very simplified military aspect to it that involves bidding. Um, it's not particularly interesting from a strategic tactic standpoint. But you could just play this game by itself. You, you could play it and you're going to start in, I think it's like 1936. Um, you can maybe support you know, stuff in the Spanish Civil War like in history. Uh, you could do a bunch of crazy ahistorical stuff. Um, and... Uh, you know, uh, play through that until, you know, one of the ideologies collapses, usually fascism or whatever, um, however you're playing it. But the game also allows, for instance, the fascists and the communists to stay teamed up, maybe, and fight the Western allies. Or, I don't know why this would ever happen, but maybe the Western allies and the fascists team up to beat communism. I, I think you can get to that level of um, ahistorical stuff in this game. Uh, and it's really, really interesting. Um, and it's it's kind of hard to show in this video easily without, you know, clicking through all of these. Uh, but the fact that there's a lot of variety in these uh, uh, actions that you have, these action cards, um, it, it just means there's a lot of options. Um, it's just really neat to kind of look at through these. I love the artwork. They're they're just kind of funny to me, um, uh, but the fact that you can, uh, you know, do these in interesting things. You have a lot of choices, and you don't have to use every action, um, you know. But it it certainly, uh, I don't know. It's it's just really neat, I guess. And and you have a lot of room to play with. If you're gonna play this with World and Flames, what happens is you keep the uh the, that hex map of ideologies you keep uh all the cards the political action cards that can really be an interesting game element um and then all the military stuff is as is world and flame so you use the normal hex map you use all of your counters um it doesn't matter what expansion other expansions you're using ships and flames planes and flames they can all be used with days of decision, I think there's a couple of wrinkles when it comes to uh, how certain types of production points can be made between the latest collector's edition and, and days of decision. I need to examine that a little more closely, but I think they're they're fairly well compatible, the new edition and days of decision. 
Um, I think it's really neat. Now, I do think it, it's going to add a decent amount of playtime to your game because, again, you're going to be making determinations about these optional political events. Um, that's going to take some extra playing around with and decision-making and reactions and maybe some uh, record-keeping of what actions have been taken and that sort of thing. But I think it lays on a really interesting, you know, uh, political aspect to the game outside the normal production and war aspects, right? It, it, if politics inflames adds a little bit of diplomacy, activity, and and you know politics to the game, Days of Decision does it a lot more, and it's more heavy, and it's more work maybe to do it, but it is super cool. So for Days of Decision three. My general thought is it's cool as heck. Uh, I want I would want to include it where I could, but knowing that it sort of forces it to be a three-player game instead of maybe a two-player game, um, that can be a challenge. Um, I think you can have more than three players, obviously, but it's hard to do Days of Decision with less than three players. And if you're doing it with World in Flames, you still have that same problem. Um, so if you think you're going to have at least three players playing World of Flames with you, it might be really fun. I think you could still do it solo and have it be fun, but just the way it sets up the ideologies against one another it just makes it harder for two players to, to do it. Um, it's still readily available, so I say give it a roll if you think the extra politics would interest you. you there's some really neat stuff you can do with the options. A lot of neat flexibility there, and in one of those annual magazines uh, that I talked about earlier in the video, uh, there's even some additional optional add-on cards and options that can be added to Days of Decision, add even more neat, neat stuff. Um, so I say it's worth a look. Check it out. Um, next is America in Flames. So uh, America in Flames sort of takes the angle um, very similar to Man in the High Castle, which was that book and Amazon series about you know the Axis powers potentially uh, winning in Europe and in Asia, and then you know they they'll hell have eventually taken over America. America in Flames is the World in Flames sort of uh, portrayal of the fight for North America and South America as a standalone game. The game is set up that you have uh, the Axis powers who are trying to make allies in Central and South America uh, and then attempting to invade and take control of the United States, the remnants of Canadian Commonwealth forces, uh, and anyone who gets in their way. Um, the allies are trying to stop them while also working to develop the H-bomb. I believe it's the H-bomb. Not just the A-bomb. The A-bomb has been developed, but the H-bomb is seen as sort of a even loftier weapon, uh, and you can win that way as the, the allies, as, a, as the United States. Um, two to five players, kind of a, a, an interesting thing. Now, uh, it has its own set of counters that come with the game. Um, they are meant to represent the forces that are in play you know, during this conflict, so some of them are going to be forces that had not shown up in World in Flames up to that point for whatever reason. I, and I can get really into the weeds on what those extra forces are. It's nothing too, too crazy, um, but it's interesting in how that works with a combination game. So, um, because of the premise of the game, it's just so ahistorical that, that it, is, it is supposing uh, a history where the Axis just utterly had curb stomped the allies in Europe that this realistically probably would not have happened. Um, same thing with Japan and the Pacific. You're, you're operating in this game as a total what-if fantasy scenario. In and of itself is probably a really interesting fun time. I've not actually played it yet. I do have a copy. Um, it's definitely interesting looking and I think would be fun to play. If I could find someone who will be willing to play it with me, along with my World in Flames fun. 
But there is utility in owning this if you just have World and Flames and you're intent on playing World and Flames. And that comes in with the super cool uh, map. And so I'm going to scroll over. This is in the big old Vassal module that's available today. This is not, not the new Vassal module that's going to be coming out. That shows... Oh, it's cut off. Dang it. Dang it, dang it. Let me see if this is... Yeah, okay, this is it. In, in total. So American Flames, you can see here. And it shows uh, the United States in greater detail than the base North American, South America map that comes with the base game. You know, that's at, at a really shrunk down scale. It's not, you know, it's the, the base game doesn't assume you're going to be doing much in that area. But if you wanted to go to greater detail, you could take this map for American Flames and, in, and and use it alongside your World and Flames base game. So it's a it's a greater uh, detail map of North America, Central America, and South America. A lot of these things on here are somewhat more relevant to playing American Flames, like these nuclear uh, test site reactor icons um, that would not really be used for anything in a uh, uh, base World and Flames game. Um, and then there's, I think there's a couple of things down here, a couple of tracks that are meant to be for American Flames, but you would safely ignore them uh, in, a, in a combined game. So this map might be worth it to you. I think it's still possible to buy this map separately, um, but you know, if you're going to go in, maybe just you know, get the whole game, and then you, you now have another game that you can play uh, besides World and Flames using the same system. Uh, and, and giving it a shot and giving it a play. Um, in terms of the actual new counters, just to show you, I guess I'm going to go to Germany just as our, our fun example. There is on here... There it is. I have to keep scrolling to the right here. Um, the uh, America in, in Flames counter set. Um, they are printed with an A in them, so you can differentiate them if you end up combining them all into uh, one big pile of counters. Uh, you can keep them separate or sort them back out again. Uh, but they have units that now stretch into 47 and 48, and they have this dark bar on the left, and I believe that signifies that these are a heavy unit, and that they are treated as sort of like an upgrade replacement counter for an existing unit. So if this is the first German paratrooper core, and it looks like it is, um, with the dark bar on the left, that means it's a heavy unit. Wherever there's the first paratrooper unit in the base game, when this is available, uh, and I think you got to pay pay for the upgrade somehow. That's uh, in the rules somewhere. Uh, you can replace it with this unit, which I'm going to guess is going to have a higher combat power. It's white print, um, that sort of thing. And so you would add, you know, if you were just playing World and Flames, and you said, you know what, I we agree we're going to use American Flames as an add-on, all you would be doing is using the map and then adding these counters to the force pools um, as the years go by. And again, what, what that's really just doing is just adding more unit variety. Um, you know, more options to play with in terms of what, what kind of units can I build, what do I want to do with it. Uh, those options are going to be there, be there for you. Um, overall, as uh, a question of what I use American Flames, uh, yeah, the answer is yes. I, I would use it, you know, maybe not my first game, but I would make those units available um, uh, to the counter pool. I would definitely use the America's map if I had the room for it. And again, if I'm playing a vassal game, why the heck not? You know, the map's probably going to be there, so you know, you know, might as well use it. Um, so yeah, it, it's a neat little game, and especially with the popularity of Man in the High Castle now, um, I think there's, I, there's probably some interest in, in a game like that. I mean, there are other games in that same vein, uh, like I think Fortress America is the name of one or something like that. But uh, if you like World and Flames and you want to play a little, play something a little bit different, a little more uh, unique scenario, American Flames is uh, is worth the time. Uh, and finally, that brings us to our last standalone expansion is Patton and Flames. Now Patton and Flames is very similar to America and Flames in a couple ways. So one, uh, it is a standalone game. 
So if you just you just bought the game, uh, you could uh, you know open it up and take out the maps and take out the counters and have a good old good old time with this game by itself. What is actually portrayed here uh, in, in the name is going off the idea that uh, Patton got his way and uh, right as World War II was ending, World War III began with the Western Allies fighting the Soviet Union for control of the world. And the game actually has two uh, scenarios, two main campaign scenarios. Uh, one, which is the war between the Western Allies and the Communists begins in 1945, before the Axis powers have even been fully defeated. And there's some funky rules about uh, how that, you know, the, the Communists control the German forces fighting the Western Allies, and the Western Allies control the German forces fighting the Soviet Union on that front. And then eventually they sort of meet in the middle and, and you're fighting for control of the world. Uh, the other scenario is in 1948. And just sort of, I think, I, I think the idea is that uh, the, the Soviet Union invades West Germany or, or something like that. And it sparks the war in 1948 um, instead. And so you don't have the Axis powers involved. Uh, and then you know, the Western Allies are sort of racing to remobilize and, and fight that war. And obviously that, that sort of changes the whole strategic situation of Europe and the Pacific and where what things are what and what's happening there. Um, and obviously it includes units that go into that time frame of 1948 into, I think, the early 50s. And I'm going to validate that comment in a second. So, uh, it, again, it, it's a situation of it's going to provide, if you're playing the base standalone game, um, a unique scenario to play out, and everyone loves the, you know, uh, forces of democracy versus communism, uh, World War III scenario, right? There's a lot of games that can sort of cover that, um, sometimes set during the 80s, but this is a very, you know, post-World War II, definitely within the World and Flames system's um, wheelhouse to portray that conflict, and, and, and it is rather interesting. Um, in terms of what it adds to a World in Flames games, is that, uh, one, the map that comes in uh, with Patton and Flames is a specialized map that shows World War II, but also shows the political boundaries for the 1948 scenario, like East Germany. So you can see East Germany's here, and uh, there's this sort of like pink outline that's showing that's East Germany, and here's Berlin within West Germany. And there's a few other places on the map where it's showing a different political boundary, though it's much harder to see, so that if you're playing the 48, you can use the 1948 uh, political boundaries for um, uh, for setup. I mean, you can see, like, here's Austria, and the new border is right here, um, or there's some sort of border here, uh, for uh, the countries and how things are set up and who controls what. Um, the, uh, the collector's edition that's coming out for World in Flames is already set up to include the Patent in Flames map information. So if you get Patent in Flames, uh, for your World in Flames game, the map will be redundant. You will not need the map, but the counters are still useful to you, as is the rule book and whatever else. Um, and the scenario information included. So that's all well and good. The, uh, again, the, so the map won't be useful. And, and even this map, um, I showed it in my World in Flames introduction video. I, I did point out the boundaries for East Germany and everything like that. So you're going to be set from that perspective. You won't need the map. Um, the counters, so similar to uh, American Flames, there is a T, Patton, I guess is, you know, because there's uh, there's already the politics and flames counters uses a P, so you're not going to use a P for patent, you're going to use a T. Um, and much like uh, the American flames counters, um, these are going to be either additions or replacement counters uh, to your force pools. Um, so you can see these go up to 1948. And, oh, look at that. Look at that. Futuristic jet, German jet fighter plane to be included. Now, uh, obviously Germany doesn't last long, uh, even in Patton and Flames. 
better example would probably be uh, the USSR. So if I look at USSR, yeah, now we're talking. Uh, and I scroll over in this gigantic vassal module. Come on. So to patent in flames, we have units that go all the way up to uh, 1951. And we can see this is a, uh, okay, MiG, MiG-17. Um, it's the 50. Uh, okay. It's kind of neat. neat. Neat to see what's out there. Um, obviously, A-bombs. There'll be A-bombs. You can drop A-bombs. You can, you know, I've seen some session reports of Patton and Flames. Europe gets flattened by A-bombs sometimes. Eh, but that's just, you know, part of the fun, isn't it? So, yeah, I mean, you, you can get, uh, uh, you could get this, and, you know, I don't know how often your World and Flames game is going to go into the 1950s. But if it does, then you have these extra forces you can have in your force pool. And if you're using the sort of spend a lot of production to get units that are further ahead in time, maybe you can get to some of these later, stronger units earlier, and, and that'll be uh, of value to you. And then, of course, um, you know, this having all these counters supports the idea that you could go from a uh, normal World War II scenario that segues into World War III um, as part of your normal game, right? You, you, you've played with your friends and you've defeated uh, the, the Axis. Um, then maybe the guys who just won the game can say, okay, now you and me fight it out for World War III. And you can segue right into that game uh, when you're using the Patton and Flames counters and everything else. And you, you get, you know, you've got all this fun stuff uh, to play with, right? I mean, I think that's, in my mind, that that's sort of the fun of what this can be used for. Um, especially useful if you're going to be using Days of Decision, because then it's, you know, you do have the three sides, and uh, they, you know, you very well could fight until there's only one I ideology dominant in the world kind of thing. Yeah. So, so in my mind, Patent and Flames is uh, a very cool game too. Uh, again, a neat variety for scenarios to try out and play. Different strategic thought processes going on in your mind rather than World War II. Uh, the extra counters work much like some of the American Flame ones. There's some replacement counters, uh, upgrade counters, um, later year counters. So, you know, hey, more at this point. You know, you're more and more counters. It's all fun. It's all great. Add them in. It's going to be a hoot. Uh, and I guess my my final thought on all of these expansions. So we'll we'll sort of do a you know come back come back to center here now that we've we've talked about each of the expansions. You could play with all of these things, right? Um, the only the only things on this list that are not compatible uh, are using politics and flames and decision days of decision three because they they cover the same domain of politics you'd get you'd pick one or the other but you could conceivably have like the ultimate world and flames games that has days of decision as a wrapper around the game, right? You're going to do all the military stuff with World and Flames. You've got all the politics and diplomacy and everything else wrapped around it with days of decision. You're going to play with the extra maps, uh, just in case you want to use those things. You're, maybe you're going to have leaders. You're going to do the factories. Um, you've got every ship and plane and territorial and divisional unit conceivable. Uh, you've included all of these, the, the map from American Flames, and you've included all the counters from both of these games in it. And that would be the biggest, you know, uh, craziest World War II monster hex encounter game uh, that you could have and still have it be, you know, relatively, um, you know, playable, right? I mean, it, it's all doable. You could add all of these things together. I I think about trying that someday, right? I, it would be really fun <laughs> to include all of these things in just one big epic game that you know you're going to play to one final ideology. You know it's going to be th you know the three three way war eventually, 
the Allies beat Germany, then you segue into World War III, and you're still using all of these things, and that's totally supportable, and they can all work together to, to give you that game experience. It just might take you forever. But, uh, yeah, so uh, this video is run for an hour and a half long. That's pretty long. Um, I tried to give each of these expansions a nice little overview about what's involved with it, why you might want to play with it, um, and whether or not I'm interested in using it. Uh, again, I, any of these things are fairly useful, um, no, matter, no matter how you look at it. And, you know, with some of these things starting to become less available, like some of these maps and some of these magazines, um, you know, it might not hurt to try to grab some of these light expansions while they're available, and then you can kind of decide to come back around to these expansions, uh, the main and the standalone expansions, you know, as you think they're going to be worthwhile to include in your game. Um, you know, obviously, if you had gone out and ordered the Super Deluxe Collector's Edition package, you're going to get almost everything, and you might just have to track down a couple of minor things like the, the Leaders in Flames. Um, so that's maybe the easiest path to getting nearly everything in the WIF world, and that's why I got that package, because I just wanted everything. I don't want to have to wait, and I just want to execute and, and jump in if I want to. And the only thing I need to worry about is punch encounters. Um, I hope this video has been useful. Um, again, I, I will have put uh, some timestamp hyperlinks in the description so you can bounce around and, and go back to a particular product description if you want to rewatch a part and you're struggling to make that final decision on whether you're going to get something. I'm amazed that I've managed to do this in one long recorded take. So thank you for bearing with me as I, my throat's getting dry and I'm coughing and I need a drink of water. Um, you know, if, if you'd like, uh, if someone requests that I dig deeper into a particular product, I can certainly try to. Uh, right now I'm just limited by the fact that I don't have some of these products on me in person and I'm working at a vassal for the most part until I can get my physical copies. To, to validate everything and, and to run through the rules with them. Um, but let me know what you think. Uh, you know, again, appreciate your views. Any likes, favoriting, subscribers, uh, all that would be great. That's going to help me keep making these, I guess, as knowing people are out there watching them. Um, I know I've got like a baker's dozen of subscribers, so thank you, subscribers. I, I appreciate your, your enthusiasm and interest in, in the videos. I'm going to try to keep them coming. Uh, and uh, again, uh, you know, uh, informational videos like this one I may keep making, uh, and eventually we're going to have some more practical videos covering actual mechanics and playthrough demonstrations. Uh, so if you're not sure about how to do a certain thing, I can maybe try to show you. Uh, so keep some uh, keep the, the questions coming. Um, if you'd like to see a certain kind of video, let me know, and I'll add it to the priority list. Uh, I need to do some more Fatal Alliance videos for Ruler 1, and I'd eventually like to branch out and do some other videos on some other games that are not World in Flames. Um, it's just a question of time. So thank you for watching. I appreciate it, and uh, we will catch you next time.